he wants us to go over, let's go over the six R's one more time. So we say, okay, here, here, how, how do they run? Well, Q is answering. I asked him and he says, recognize how mind's attention moves off the object of meditation. Discover that. It's very interesting because the hindrance is not attacking you. The hindrance is innocent. <laughs> you know, actually, this is a deeper question. How did your mind's attention go off the object of meditation? You lost interest, you lowered your energy, you dropped your mindfulness, you see? These are the pieces in your practice. And so it's up to you to put those back in. Um, so then you release whatever is beginning to distract you and just let it be there, leave it alone. Don't You don't have to stop it, kill it, bury it and have a cemetery you know, service. You don't have to do that. <laughs> It's just let go of it and it'll be there and then it'll go away because of a Nietzsche. And then relax any leftover tension in your mind and body. I said, right, now do this in one flowing motion. It has to be in one flowing motion. The whole six actually has to be in one flowing motion of less than three seconds because then you re-smile to lighten up your mind and sharpen your awareness. As you gently return mind's attention back to the object of meditation and you keep the wholesome meditation going. This is right. You repeat the cycle only as needed, which means it is beginning to distract you. That's what that means when it says when the cycle is needed. So things come up and come up and come up and come up. There's two things you need to remember. In the instructions, um, I think, May, you asked me a question last week about this, about I'm paying attention to this craving cycle and the, another one is coming up behind it. Do you remember the basic instructions for how to practice TWIM? If you look in there, one of the things that says you do this and maybe you have to do it 50 times. And the question is, what was good meditation that session or what was bad meditation? And Bonte points out, if you had to do that 50 times in a row in a meditation to get your mind to understand every single time, I recognize, release, relax, smile. I, I rec Well, I let it go, relax, smile, come back. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. You see, eventually your brain gets Oh my gosh, he wants us to just let go, relax, smile, and come back. <laughs> and your brain says, okay, I'll do that from now on. And that's how it flips from trying to practice it over to automatic, where all of a sudden your faculties swing into powers and everything is easier to work with in the whole structure. One of the things that happens to us is in other types of practices, there was a lot involved in pausing and checking the body and checking for this and that and the other. And one of the things we have to do is, can the student come to TWIM? And the reason we give you the Brahma Viharas is we, if you had, pretend you have a beginner's mind, Pretend that you are empty. I try to tell them this at the beginning of the retreat. I mean empty. You know nothing. I know nothing <laughs> about this. And then you start to listen to the instructions. Then you try to meditate. So you're only hearing what we're telling you. And you don't check the whole body to make sure it's relaxed. That's a no-no. That's left from another practice. There was nothing that said stop when you know when you let go of the the uh, let go of the tension and tightness was just let go. It was no more than the actual just letting go of this um, top on the pen. You know, it's in my hand and I just let go and it drops. That's the letting go. One person held me up one time in a retreat and said, wait a second, you have to dissect and tell us step by step, how do you let go? I just smiled and I said, okay, here we go. Are you ready? Let go. And that's the entire instructions for letting go. You're holding on to it and you let go of it, whatever thought it was or feeling or itch or heat or anything, vibration. 
Now, the other piece of this is for those of us who are geniuses out there and have good brains, we went over the laws of meditation. And in that we covered what do hindrances have for us? Distractions, disturbances, taints, fetters, and all those things. If we go through the whole book and we take all those words, I think I gave you 11 words one time, I was shocked. I looked at an old document and it had 11 words there, barriers, blockages, hindrances, um, obstacles, obstructions, just on and on. I went and then taints and fetters are included. And all of that stuff is considered blocking you. Then we gave you a law for anything that is a hindrance. And we said it has absolutely nothing when we examine the hindrance or distraction or disturbance. We... In wherever it is in written about, we find that the key piece, even in number two, okay, I say that one because I'll tell you why in a second, even in Majima Nikaya number two, okay, but the key to the whole thing is just they have no value for you at all. They have no information for you at all. So stop trying to be so precise to find out why or what this is. The only time it, it matters is if, um, okay, this is the only time it would matter, May, is like if it was a, um, you had a distraction and you were letting it go and another one was coming up with the same distraction, you see? And if that's happening, then we need to step over maybe to just say uh, to ourselves, why is this one piece coming up again and again and again and again to discover if that is a point of craving? Maybe we need to go to forgiveness. Maybe we need to forgive that if we can see what it is or discover what that piece is. And that's what we mean when we say to you that the distraction is a teacher. You see, it's a teacher. Now, okay, I said something about number two. So let's go in here to number two for a minute to the Sabasava. And Sabasava is a good example. The Sabasava is, is a good example of giving you what you should do. It gives you, it's interesting because the Sutta gives you in section three in the beginning, it gives you the summary. And I don't know if it repeats the summary at the end. I didn't look. Maybe it does. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It did. In the front, it says, there are taints that, sh it, it does it in the front in the very beginning at number three and number four. But just read four. There are taints that should be abandoned by seeing, taints that should be abandoned by restraining, taints that should be abandoned by using, taints that should be abandoned by enduring, taints that should be abandoned by avoiding, taints that should be abandoned by removing, and taints that should be abandoned by developing. Now, the secret to this thing is, first of all, you need to understand in every one of those statements, you are abandoning it right? You're abandoning it. And second of all, I wonder when we start in the beginning of the book like this, and we find it in number two, I wonder if they told us how to abandon something when we're seeing it, or abandon it when uh, by restraining. I wonder if they told us a method that is not that is not having me personally involved in any work doing this. This is interesting when you look at it, because when you go through these, we can examine this someday, but when we go through these, if you, by avoiding it, you know, it, I don't know how to explain this thing. <laughs> it's tough um, in, in a short version. I can do it in a very long version, but you're always abandoning every single one. If you don't have the knowledge, enough knowledge about how every, everything works here, you're going to struggle to restrain, struggle uh, to uh, figure out why, how can I use this, struggle to endure it, struggle to try to make yourself avoid it. You see what I'm saying? But if you get more knowledge about what? 
about how the hindrance came up and how it actually worked. So the reason I say it's funny that it comes up at number two sutta is because it can be very misunderstood. And I believe that it has been very misunderstood because without clearly understanding how to use dependent origination when you look at these things, okay, and understand how they operate and understand what feeds a hindrance in the first place, you would struggle after reading this hindrance. Do you understand? So we have to not, this is a good example of someone who would take the sutta as a basis of how to handle a hindrance without full knowledge of how they operate and what feeds them. Do you see that? You see it? But once you have the truth of a hindrance, the knowledge of how it operates and what feeds it, and you know you've been told straight out in some places, it has no value for you at all. It is called careless attention that is paid to any hindrance. Then you would not misunderstand that, but it takes a little work. So I kind of wondered, I questioned Bhante's, why isn't this in the hundreds instead of in the, the single digits back here at number two, because it can really throw you off course. Because one of the things that happens today is that Pearson will get stuck saying, this is the Buddhism. This one sutta is the Buddhism, nothing else. <laughs> and I'm there like, wait a minute, wait a second. I mean, the man, he taught, 82,000 lessons. And as Arahats taught um, an, another, uh, let's see, 82, 2,000 more, right? 84,000 more his and eight, gets to 86,000. The other 2,000 belong to him. Do you think there's one hindrance in that book that could do that? And there isn't. Because you keep running into issues on the items discussed in one sutta. And if you don't have the pieces of that, you cannot, it would be like me coming to you and say, look, I got a new car. It's got a carburetor under the hood, <laughs> just a carburetor. And that's all. And I'm going to get in and drive it. Watch this. It's a miracle. <laughs> yes, it would be. You, see? you cannot have an engine without the parts in it. That's what I'm trying to trying to say here. So we have to be very careful. But the key stringing word that strings thread threads these pieces together in that sutta is abandonment. Abandonment. And then you go to the Upakalesa Sutta, and it has like 13 different kinds of hypnosis. And the key to the whole thing is once you understand what an imperfection is in the summary on the last page of Majjhima Nikaya number 128, Upakalesa Sutta, you understand that the moment I see this imperfection, which means interruption for my meditation, basically. Once I see it that way, this, the, the um, solution is to abandon it. I see it as an imperfection. So this is what I was wanting to make sure we understood. But there's things that I, I told, I think I told you when I wrote you about this um, idea of the craving coming once and there's more craving behind it. You know, I said there was, you can't look at the circles of the dependent origination like one, two, three, four, five, because they're actually like, more like a spiral that is of wire that is going down. It's all hooked together and they're flowing all the time. You don't want to stop it. You want to ignore it. You see, that's the big thing, ignoring it. And let go, you examine yourself because many of us liked a lot. <laughs> a lot of us really liked to dissect things in the beginning. We wanted to stop, look, see, examine every piece and see if we couldn't stop here and just go again and stop there and like that. But we, we realized we didn't have to dissect once we learned knowledge about how things actually worked. 
So the entire cycle of the six R's, it should run through like rolling your R's, meaning like that, okay? And last about three seconds or a second to three seconds long is in, a, in the complete operation each time. So recognize, release, relax, re smile, return, repeat. Recognize, release, relax, re smile, return, repeat. Blah, 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 like that. And you're going to your brain until it flips. And then it will take care of it because it'll finally figure it out. Okay, it runs like this. The maximum of three seconds to begin with recognize, release, relax, re smile, return, repeat. The cycle is the same as keeping harmonious practice going to fulfill the fold of the noble eightfold path called right effort. And you keep doing this in the same way every time to retrain your brain, refocus, re re reframe it. And so, how is the craving identified in the body? The craving is the first tiny jerk in energy that first kicks in to cause an increase in tension and tightness in the body and the mind. That's what craving, that's what happens. The problem people have if they're coming, I, I've examined this with a number of students now, someone remarked to me, oh, that's ridiculous. There's nothing there like that. And then I looked into who is the person studying with? What kind of practice is it? And it's total one point of concentration glued to the object, absolutely glued to it, okay? And they're concentrating so hard that takes a lot of tension to do this, okay? And when you're doing that, can you sense that change in the body? And the answer is no. So first you have to let go of this completely and open up your visual, observation frame inside and be very, very quiet. And the less tension in your tightness as you're learning to do this, the faster you realize there is an increase upward. That's how this works. Now, uh, telling you that craving has arrived and it needs to be released. Okay, so do you Remember I told you when we meditate, we're attempting to investigate a state of no tension and tightness. That's where we're going. And he says, yes. And in order to understand the importance of letting go here, we first have to understand what is going on. So to do this, we have to take a look at the brain and the presence or absence of tension in the brain can be seen with equipment and monitors the brain. Time for anatomy now? <laughs> yeah, just a bit, okay. Looking at the brain, there are two lobes and the two lobes are surrounded by the thin membrane that is called the meninges. This is a membrane, it's actually a sac. Membranes can have little vessels and things in them, but sacs cannot. Okay, anytime mind's attention is disturbed, tension arises. The meninges surrounding the brain is not a muscle. It is a sack, and when we start uh, to think, the gray matter swells very slightly against the sack, and the sack is being pressed. And this is the tightening. In it, this tightening is what you are learning to notice. And this is a natural thing. There's a sack on this one, and a sack on the other side. And then they come together in the back, they run down the spine, all the way down the spine, most of the way down the spine. And so the sac is being pressed by the tightening against the gray matter. And we can first notice a change in the facial appearance when the tension arises. You can see it in the person's eyes. Mostly they go like that, they squint. You can, I can watch them meditating in a group in front of me in a hall and see where it's happening, I can watch it. And if they are not smiling, it happens more. So as we per perform the relaxed step to release the tension and tightness, uh, this membrane goes, it, it just goes apart. The, the tightness of these two, it goes apart slightly like that. And if we move mind's attention, uh, the student senses the slight separation between the lobes that occur. And if we move uh, mind's attention back to the object of meditation while it is relaxed like this, then we can feel mind drop down a, 
a little deeper each time to do uh, to allow for a deeper investigation. This is where it just drops down. Okay, and it, it, the point where you can feel that. Let's see if I tell you. On the night of his enlightenment, it is suspected that the Buddha decided to tranquilize his bodily formation and his mental formation. And perhaps this is what changed within the Buddha's practice so that he could fall over into Neroda. Finally, he was able to experience an aware jhana state. And as the Buddha describes in the Anupada uh, Sutta, by applying, uh, by applying this tranquilization step, now see, the, the, the Anupada Sutta, always remember, the Buddha is teaching the monks the report that Sariputta gave him. He's re re repeating it verbatim to them. It isn't that Sariputta is teaching that sutta. At first, I thought he was, but he's not. You know, it's actually the monk, the Buddha is declaring that this is the way to do it. And he sh he's telling you precisely this very accurate report that Sariputta gave him. So this was a new idea. This whole thing was a new idea, different from his earlier experiences in absorption jhana states. And it explains how the Buddha entered into the deeper states with full awareness. And this aware jhana allowed him to realize more information about each of these levels of understanding. Later on, he taught people how uh, this could be useful in daily life, and it helped them to reduce their suffering. And how useful the practice becomes for each person is determined by the degree that that person sticks to the instructions for the practice precisely. If they deviate and go off and try to use things that are coming from other practices mixed into TWIM, it doesn't work. It's simple. It just doesn't work. It's like fooling around with a pastry recipe when they tell you precisely you can only touch the dough twice when you're squeezing it and you want to go, you know, like this to it, like bread. And then your pastry dough doesn't come out light and fluffy. It comes out hard like a pie crust. It doesn't work. You can't mix the ideas together. 